good evening dear friends so today we have this very interesting book launching project the enlightened gene and this book primarily discusses about the dialogue or discussion between biology and buddhism how american scientists and tibetan monks are transforming the ways we think about science and religion my very good friend professor ayri aizen i had the privilege of knowing him for so many years and he is not kind of very much even though he speaks very less very much into the program we have launched and for so many years since the emory tibet science initiative took place in the year 2006 since then he has been a committed veteran i call it and uh, not only his scholarship but in every area where there's a possibility to extend help he's fully behind it and he's very much behind writing all the science books that is now used in the monasteries writing those curriculums he was working behind that and uh, then we have geshe yungdung konjok who was the among the first groups who went to study for three years in america study science so while he's there they had this they had this very interesting idea of writing a book based on their kind of conversation so this book is about biology and how we teach and learn it it is about how an unusual project involving american scientists and buddhist monks can enlighten us in teaching and learning across world view and in general uh so the two leaders of this project one a scientist and one monk tells the story when we first published the first you know science curriculum book and handed over it to his holiness his holiness then told ari that it is education that we need it is education that will change the world not meditation not religion but education his holiness the dalai lama requested that our new science curriculum for the monks and nuns focus on the life sciences with a special emphasis in neuroscience and physics about a dozen professors from these areas and from tibetan studies became meeting at emory of course we started from a scratch how to teach science to educated young men and women who know how to learn but who know very little science or math how much knowledge in science did the monks and nuns actually have what aspects of tibetan culture and history and tibetan monastic culture can be related to this project so there were a lot of questions so it's an ongoing program and uh, as you're all aware as we have published this little book about the the process of our science initiative with emory university and uh, many other universities in america and in this book we have quoted his holiness very solemnly said i have long believed in and advocated a dialogue and cross fertilization between science and spirituality as both are essential for enriching human life and alleviating suffering on both individual and global levels the emory tibet science initiative has a unique opportunity to fulfill this need and i'm glad to say since that time until now emory science teachers have taught several thousands of monks in the monasteries right now the summer one of the workshop is taking place in south india so during this years we the, the whole many of this years has really been a success story as far as teaching science in the monasteries are concerned so i would like to recall those opportunities and thank ari on this occasion and for everybody who has been supporting all of you and related to this today's topic i found a very interesting writer by somebody so I, i'm tempted to read this just two line becoming enlightened is a biological process in which the frontal lobes the antenna to the divine of the brain are being activated 
and the peripheral lobes close down. So you're going to speak on this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Kashila, and everyone for coming. Um, it's an honor for us to be here, uh, and it's kind of symbolic because this project really started here as a partnership with Kashila Akdor and the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives working together. It's still a partnership. And the first six years, I guess, was here at Sarah College at the bottom of the hill where we began experimenting in how to work together, so it's, it's nice to be here. For those of you that were at yesterday's talk, uh, this is a little bit different. We're not brothers, <laughs> at least not in the genetic sense, but I would say that now, you know, symbolically we're, we're brothers and maybe in past life we were brothers, I don't know. Um, also, we're not famous, we're just regular guys. I'm a teacher, Gunchuk's a monk, so um, it's also different in that way. This is just what we do every day. So the way we th thought we would uh, do today's discussion is that we would read a little bit of, I would read a little bit from the book and then ask uh, Geshe a question and he would answer and then he would read a little bit from what he wrote in the book and ask me a question and then I would answer and we would just alternate a couple of times around some of the big questions that we try and address in the book and then we would just open it up for questions because whenever we talk about this project, I've talked about it all over the world, in Japan, in the United States, and India, there's always a lot of energy and questions. So I like to leave a lot of time for questions. So um, I'll just start off uh, by saying a couple of things about how this project got started about a decade ago maybe. Um, so we've been coming and teaching here for many years, but also monks uh, through the Tenzin Gyatso Institute, monks and nuns come to Emory University in Atlanta and study there. And Kuncho, my friend here, was in the first group of monks that came to Atlanta, six monks for three years. And we would meet every week and talk about science and talk, talk about life and Kunchuk and I got to be very good friends, especially. And the more we talked, the more we thought. One day we were talking over coffee and we just realized we needed to tell the world about, about this story, about who we were and what we had done. So we decided we'd write a book. So that was probably seven, eight, nine years ago. And now this book was just published. And uh, we're gonna leave two copies of the book in the library here for the library that we both signed. And then also this book is available wherever you buy books, on Amazon India, and maybe in the bookshop here one day. And Kunchuk is going to translate it into Tibetan, right? Yeah. He will try. Okay. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the book and ask Kunchuk a question. So this is just the prologue to the book. The Do His Holiness wrote the foreword, and this is the prologue. And we start with a quotation from the Buddha who said, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. In just my short 25 year career, biology has dramatically changed. To keep up with the breadth, depth, and amount of new knowledge generated these days, even one small corner of it is nearly impossible. But imagine entering the scene from an entirely different world, one in which you have barely a scrap of previous exposure to science in your 600 year tradition of learning. How would the nature of your learning change? The nature of the teaching? How would the science itself change? This book is about biology and Buddhism. It's about how an unusual project involving American scientists and Buddhist monks can enlighten us in teaching and learning across worldviews and in general. Two leaders of the project, me and this guy, tell the story. So now we're moving to Dharamsala in 2011. The Dalai Lama sat before us on a big wooden chair. This was the annual audience to update him on our project teaching science to Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns. 
In 2005, the Dalai Lama invited Emory University in Atlanta to develop and establish a modern science program to become part of the centuries-old curriculum of his 20,000 monastics in exile. Through his lifelong interest in science and his recent conversations with neuroscientists, he saw the great potential for alleviating suffering and enriching humanity by integrating cutting-edge science with ancient wisdom, while at the same time engaging monks and nuns in 21st century knowledge. In retrospect, I see why I was attracted to the Emory Tibet project. The Dalai Lama and Kunchok are interested in how science and medicine can help people of faith, while I am interested in how faith and belief can help people of science. In the United States, there's an idea that religion and belief, and for some, even ethics, should be excluded from science, actually excluded from the academy altogether. But this works to the detriment of scientists and science in a country where religious belief is very strong. I teach science to some of the best undergraduates in the United States, the nation's future physicians and researchers. When I ask them, say, if they believe in evolution, nearly all of them say yes. Then when I ask the same students if they believe something in addition to evolution had a role in making the human species what it is, half or more of them also say yes. So why ignore the elephant in the room? Why should scientists not address the beliefs of our students head on? Maybe teaching monks science in Dharamsala and undergraduate science in Emory is not that different. In America, we often teach across different cultures and religions, assumptions, knowledge, and experiences. In my lab are men and women who grew up in Egypt, China, India, Italy, and the United States. My students, whether I'm teaching science or ethics, undergraduates or physicians, are at least as diverse. The original hope of the Dalai Lama was that our project would integrate ideas and practices of modern science and Tibetan Buddhism, especially modern neuroscience with ancient mind-body knowledge to help relieve suffering in the world. At the same time, he realized monks and nuns must understand the basics of science to be effective citizens of the 21st century. We have made strides in these directions as well as into many unexpected areas, including learning across cultures and within different belief systems within those cultures. We're learning how approaching the same information with a shift in perspective can dramatically change how we explore and expand that information. Here's an irony. American scientists are often less open to the possibility that ideas from Buddhism or other religions have relevance to their work than the Dalai Lama and the monks and nuns involved in our project are open to Western science and medicine having an impact on their beliefs. And scientists are the ones who are often accuse people of faith of being closed-minded and not listening to reason. Perhaps one of the legacies of the Emory Tibet Initiative, as it expands into the monasteries and the science has become a permanent part of the monastic curriculum, will be to provide a model for effective interaction and occasional integration between science and faith communities. Perhaps moving the discussion out of the Judeo-Christian forum, out of what we Westerners know best, will make the conversation easier. Then we can go back and apply lessons learned. So Gunchuk, I was wondering, um, thinking back to the first time we met here in Dharamsala uh, 10 years ago, and you were sitting on the floor with the other monks, and I walked in without knowing what I was doing or what I was going to do. Uh, from that moment, and of course we've become friends since then, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you changed and as you became kind of a scientist. Maybe first how you became a monk and then how you became a scientist and how you've seen yourself change over the last decade. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, before answer to your question, I thought maybe I can you know, speak in Tibetan so I can explain very clearly because my English is not that good. Uh, but you might think like, no, so even my English is not good, but we, we wrote it like, no, the, the, the books in English, so you might get surprised. So, and also you said we are not... Yeah, I'm, I'm also there's less people today, so I'm a little bit confident. <laughs> and you say we are not uh, uh, brothers, but you said that we were a brother in past life. So I want to thank you to you, and because 
you believe in past life, even you are scientists. So I'm feeling very much appreciated. So, <clears throat> so uh, as mentioned, Gisela has mentioned that. So uh, actually, I was born in uh, a border uh, nearby Mount Kailash. Uh, and when I was seven years old, and I came to India, and I've been to school up to eighth grade. So when I was at the school where I've been, so at that time, it's only up to eighth grade. So after eighth grade, so I joined the monastery and I started to study the philosophy and the Buddhism. So and be, uh, before uh, I came to Emory uh, Science Initi Emory Tibet Science Initiative, so. Uh, I studied a little bit science when I was at school. Uh, it was just general science. And so at the time, so I was really a little bit interested in learning science. And also, like, uh, uh, before I uh, came to you know, the, the initiative, uh, so when I go somewhere and when I see something, uh, I see as a nature, just the nature, uh, when I see people or, or trees, whatever, just a nature. And when I studied the, when I started study science and I joined the, the initiative, so after that, so my view and looking at the nature, uh, it totally changed. So uh, when I go stroll or walk, I see something, I, uh, I always thinking about the questions, why it looks like that why some trees are tall, some are short, and some why people are like, they are different people. And also like, you no, know, so those things like the, the looking at the nature is totally changed uh, compared to the before and right now. So, uh, and then since I studied the you know, science and then uh, the way of their the teaching, Western uh, professor and Western teacher, and also I have experienced that uh, back in the Emory University. So way of their teaching uh, are a little bit, I mean, I can say like very much different from uh, where, so our teacher teach at monastery. And so so right now I'm also teaching uh, like uh, some, uh, I mean like back in the monastery for the uh, junior monks. So I use the same, I, I, I'm always trying to I uh, used the, the method they used in, back in uh, United States and then a uh, professor who came from the United States. So this uh, makes more, I mean, like helpful to understand, like, you know, uh, inside of the, you know, the, the whatever, the lesson or concept or whatever. So these things, like, you know, also make me change and then also for the, you know, students. So, this is the you know, why you know I, I will give you the example like you no know, so in the Western scientists when they teach in the class they not only they give the lecture also they demonstrate they show the demonstration and example and also the, the like they use uh, uh, experiments all those things so I use the same uh, the the method trying to do the same matter. For example, uh, in the physics or, or Western cosmology, when you talk about the, uh, the formation of the universe and expansion of the universe, and then planets, you know, expansion from each other. So uh, they, uh, they use the like balloon you know, to demonstrate it, you know, demonstrating the how each planet moving from each other. Same thing like when, I teach like the, the Buddhist cosmology, especially the, 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 the design of the, you know, the, the Mount Miru and then the middle of the, you know, middle there's Mount Miru and then four direction there's the four continents and then there are seven rivers, seven mountains. So I use the like the one monks in the center and then four directions like each monk to represent the, the four continents. And then so several monks like, you know, uh, with the ropes, you know, uh, sitting round, so it's the, uh, uh, representing the you know the seven mountain and seven rivers, like now. So that makes sense, like uh, the student very well. Otherwise, if we teach only the lecture or we give the lecture, so 
only the imagination, so they can't, you know, the see the real, uh, the the structure or whatever. Yes. Whenever, whenever we talk about this project, people always ask, "What do you do when there's tensions between Buddhism and science? How do you handle those?" Um, so we thought we'd give an example of of that and how how we address that. So. Um, we, we have a six-year curriculum that all the monks and nuns are, are learning. They start with an introduction year, and then there's uh, a year, and they do that in biology, in neuroscience, and in physics. So when we were piloting the f second year, we were teaching the monks and nuns about cells and about genes. So I was trying to think about oh, how do you teach something like that that you can't easily see. It's hard to see genes, it's hard to see cells, it's hard to imagine what these things look like, especially if you haven't really grown up in a culture where that's part of the conversation. So I thought I would teach it through the question, are bacteria sentient? Are bacteria sentient? Which is a question we don't normally think about in the West, but of course has implications for Buddhism, because I don't have to tell most of you are Buddhists what, what the implications are. So, um, so we did, we had all the monks and nuns grow some bacteria on a plate, because bacteria are everywhere. They're on their fingers and their ears, on the door handles and the toilet seat. So they just got some bacteria and they grew the bacteria. And they had to design experiments. They were also teaching the experimental method. So they had to design experiments to test whether they thought the bacteria were sentient or not, to test the hypothesis that bacteria are sentient or not. So what Kunchuk is going to read now is kind of his reflections in the book about the experience of trying to decide are they sentient or not. <coughs> That's the truth. And um, so when the, the question came up, like, you know, are the bacteria the sentient? So we uh, actually, we, um, the Buddhist monk uh, doesn't have any ideas, you know, so what we, uh, I mean, the answer, what we will answer. And then uh, we, first we collected, like, you know, the bacteria from the, you know, the cheek and then all those things. And then we uh, did the experiment and then uh, the, the professor and, you know, the Dr. Ivory, you know, they, they shown on the project, you know, and then, they, they, they really we saw that like something is moving there like you no know, towards their food and there are something some some like you no know, pieces that like are dancing and some are moving and yeah, so we set, we set up the bacteria so you could look under the microscope and we projected them on the wall so you could see what was under the microscope on the wall you could see all the little cells dancing around and then the monks tested this idea right yeah. by giving them sugar or something, putting some sugar on the edge of the slide, and they said, well, if the bacteria are moving towards the sugar, maybe they're sentient, right? So they could see all this happening. It was quite dramatic in this room down at Sarah College because you could see these little cells dancing and you could see them responding to what they were putting on the slide. So you want to, you want to read what you... Yeah, so think? after seeing uh, to this, you know, the, the picture, so in our groups, there's two groups. So I will read my, uh, what I wrote here. In our group discussion, whether bacteria are sentient beings, we had two opinions. We were split before the experiment. My, I myself was thinking bacteria are not sentient. But when we saw that images, the bacteria moving towards food on the wall, then I thought this was real. I thought they could be sentient before this I thought just because they move and find food. This doesn't mean that they have to be sentenced, but in the microscope, it looks like the cells had a purpose. After our experiments, we monks talk a lot. I thought maybe this bacteria have sense, senses, maybe even emotion. They feel where food is, maybe they are sentenced. This was the first lab experiment we ever did. We saw the bacteria on the wall. The most of us got it then, what sentence do. In actually doing it, not just saying it, many monks change their minds. 
Back in my monastery, the monks always ask, how do you do experiments? How do you use the equipment? In our own philosophy, we debate on what Buddha taught. We explore the logic of text and rationality. When you say sentence, hypothesis, experiment, analyze, monks say how. When we did this experiment, things made sense. This became strong evidence. We had some negative ideas taught to us about science, but that experiment clarified some doubt about science. Some monks didn't believe in science, but when we did this experiment, we saw this with our own eyes. A kind of truth. Not only that, the evidence really inspired us a lot. The experiment motivated us to learn more science and explore more. So we, when we saw that, so, so, so different ideas came up. So still I'm, I'm not, still I'm in doubt. So I want to ask you, so you have, you are the scientist and you have been like teaching science for monks and Buddhist monk for many years. And you have also uh, studied the Buddhist and you not only study, I mean, teaching monks, you met with Geshe-la and His Holiness and others, uh, Buddhist scholars and Geshe's. So how you think, what you think, are you still thinking that bacteria are sentence or not? Uh, good question. Um, I should say that we spent a whole week asking this question as the monks were learning about how the cells were responding to the sugar and what, cell, what are the parts of the cell and what are genes and how genes were encoding the parts of the cell. And we had them debate, Tibetan style, very dramatically, whether it was bacteria or sentient or not. And they were tearing each other's clothes and things. And, um, so at the end of the week, everybody's sitting there and we're finished. We spent eight days, six hours a day, we're all exhausted addressing this question, learning about cells and genes. So I said, all right, let's take a vote. How many of you think bacteria are sentient? How many of you think bacteria are not sentient? And it was exactly split 50-50. So I thought that was perfect. Um, you know, because science is complicated, questions are complicated, and like Kunchek was saying, we don't, it's a complicated question, are bacteria sentient? So I don't know, but I do know this, that the more I th thought about that question, at first I was just doing it to get the monks and nuns thinking, but the more I thought about it, uh, and you know, most scientists, all American scientists, if you ask them are bacteria sentient, they just look at you kind of funny. <laughs> And they wouldn't really care. And at first I was just doing it as a teaching tool, but then I realized it could have had dramatic influence on history, on human history for this reason. Because the first time we saw, a human saw bacteria under the microscope was in the context of Europe uh, in the 1600s and 1700s, a little earlier, as a causative agent for disease. So we saw the bacteria, we thought they were the cause for disease, so being the typical Western response was we just killed them. We killed all the bacteria. In fact, we spent 150 years killing bacteria. Well, come the 21st century, what do we find out? We find out that yes, we were killing the bad bacteria, but we we're also killing good bacteria. And we didn't know that the good bacteria existed. We in the West didn't know the good bacteria existed. It's called the microbiome. We've only just discovered that since you guys were born. It turns out those bacteria are vital for our health. And now many of us scientists ironically believe that many of the awful diseases that are killing us in the West, the chronic diseases that are killing us in the West, are due to the fact that for generations we were killing bacteria the good bacteria along with the bad bacteria. So now I think, what if we had been Buddhist scientists that discovered bacteria and thought of them as sentient? We may have, all of human history may have been different. So these aren't just philosophical, meaningless questions. How you think about science 
and from what cultural perspective has a very big impact on how you act, how you intervene, whether or not you intervene. Uh, we want to talk about two more big questions and then we'll take questions from you. Um, so what I just, the example I just gave was just one of many examples of how this project has changed us in bigger ways, bigger ways than just talking to each other's monks to scientists. So I wanted to give another example of how teaching monks and nuns has changed the way that I think about teaching in general. So when I started this project, I'd already been teaching for 20 years, so I thought I knew what I was doing. But now, 10 years later, <coughs> I have some different ideas that were inspired by the project. So I'll just read a couple of short excerpts about that. All teaching is a kind of translation. Good teaching is good translation. To translate effectively, teachers must know their students. Before going to Dharamsala, we spent two years studying Tibetan Buddhist culture and, and talking with Tibetan monks and educators who had worked with them. How could we teach science to intelligent people who have not had a significant change in their curriculum, focused on Buddhist philosophy and ancient texts for six centuries? People from as different a world from ours as imaginable. A world wary of science, like Kunchuk was saying. How could we teach science well to people who know absolutely no math, who have never thought in terms of scientific experiments, who have rarely written a paper or been on the internet? How could we teach modern science to people who believe in reincarnation? Often we think of ideas and information being lost in translation. The number of formal and informal languages in our project with the monks and nuns, Tibetan, Hindi, English, Nepali, Kannada, Chinese, Mongolian, mathematics, neuroscience, monk, physics, is mind-boggling. Initially, the translation heaviness of the project seemed like an obstacle. So when we teach to the monks and nuns, every few sentences we have to stop. And then the translators, these wonderful translators, Paldan and Karma, you know many of them, they have to translate what we say. So we're, at the beginning we were thinking, how are we ever going to get through any information if we have to stop every few seconds and, and, and get it translated? But now, nearly a decade later, I see the opposite is true. At first, we bemoan the fact that we would not be able to cover much material with the monks and nuns because we had to stop every few sentences, like I was saying. The process of translation, as it passes from the teacher's cells and organs to the monks and nuns to the translators and back again, creates time and space for reflection and deeper understanding. There's a strong feeling among the monastics and the, that the translators are much more than technicians connecting English to Tibetan and scientists to monastics, but that they are also, quote, restless mediators, listening carefully to the teachers, explaining what they say clearly, carrying the monastics' questions to the scientists, and bringing the answers back. Our project involves a different kind of symbiosis that I do not see at first. It's late afternoon and I'm strolling in the foothills with Don Dupe, one of the monks who's already fluent in English. The air is electric. We've just been up at the tree line. And as I learn later, some of the monks hadn't been in the high altitude mountain air of their youth since they first escaped from Tibet and traveled to the mon monasteries in the lowlands of South India years before. They're giddy. Don Dupe is a big basketball fan and a devoted monk. I ask him why is he doing this? Why instead of focusing on his monastic studies is he here participating in our somewhat wild pie in the sky experiment learning modern science far from his home monastery? First he says because the Dalai Lama thinks it's a good idea. Good answer. And then I study modern science to understand my Buddhism better. This pulls me up short. I literally stop walking. This is the symbiosis I hadn't seen. The insight itself sounds so unwestern to me. Our project isn't about converting people. 
either Westerners or monks, but rather about enhancing and deepening the knowledge our students and we already have. So this is just a couple of examples how working in this project where there's this very dramatic difference between us Western scientists and these bald men and women sitting on the floor. This, it draws these very stark distinctions, but they turn out, what we learn turns out to be relevant to all of teaching. So for example, this idea of translation. Well, ironically, when I teach in the United States, my classes are even more diverse from even more cultures maybe 15 or 20 different religions and cultures when I teach science. But I'd never thought about the fact that, I never thought about that. I just thought I was teaching them science and science is true and they're gonna, I'm gonna make them like me. They need to learn science. But from doing this project, I realized that that's not what I should be doing. What I should be doing is like Don Du. He said, he's not trying to become like me. He's trying to become a better Buddhist, understand his Buddhism better by studying science, the old Nalanda tradition to understand everybody's worldview so you can understand your own better. So that I realize that's what I need to be doing in my classroom, wherever it is, whatever part of the world is, not trying to convert people to be like me, but to get them to be better versions of who they are. And that that's a kind of translation. You see what I'm saying? That's a kind of translation. So you're translating your experience and your knowledge into their understanding of the world, which is a very different way of thinking about teaching, especially teaching science than, than I had ever done or most of my colleagues had ever done. So um, you, you already addressed this a little bit. Um, so I've talked a little bit about how this project changed me outside of the project back in the United States. But maybe you could talk a little bit more about how this project has changed you outside of the project, when you go back to a Monry Monastery and such? Let me take a long breath. So you're asking me the typical question, so I ask you a simple question. <laughs> so let me take a long breath. <laughs> so it's, it's, I mean, like, it's very wide and profound question. And this same question, like you know, normally, so when we go back to monastery and then senior monks always asking, so what do you learn like, you know, during the workshop, science workshop? And so you, you have been uh, like uh, many years and so what makes you uh, different you know, learning science and what is help uh, to study your, uh, the Buddhism of philosophy? So, Sometimes I get like answers. Sometimes it's uh, it's very difficult like you know, to address the answer because if you give the answer once, I mean like as a as a the 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 Buddhist debater like you know, studying dialectics, sometimes it's very hard to give the specific answer because you have to think a lot because if you give a one answer and then they will debate. Oh, so you said this, so then they will bring another sort of like you no. Know, so it's very difficult to uh, give like uh, one answer. You have to give, look all around, and then also you have to think a lot. So I mean, like, so it, the as the Dundups, you know, you mentioned, you know, it's not uh, it's help to uh, to learn the uh, Buddhist philosophy, and also for me also I have experienced that, you know, so learning the Western science is very very much helpful to. Uh, I mean, to study the uh, Buddhist philosophy. For example, in the Buddhist philosophy, we talk a lot about impermanence and cause and impact and a lot of things. And so when you, uh, especially when you, uh, uh, the, the biology and especially the autonomic, like the, so like the biology, when you t talk about the Inner, inner organs and then so your body part. So the function of the, the heart is like we say every moment we change, we really change and then we uh, at the same thing like you know, so you know, the, the functioning of the heart is also 
every movement and every momentary day functioning, functioning, like, you know, if it stops functioning, then we will die. So same thing, like, you know, it, uh, through the looking at the uh, heart function, you will understand, the, you know, so how, you know, the meaning of the impermanence, those things, and then there are many other examples, so the lacking of the time, I mean, so, I, I think I hope you, you know you will ask the question later again, like you know about the those uh, question. So that's it. We, we wanted to do we wanted to address one more thing and then open for questions, and that is how this project has emphasized to us something we suggested already, and that is how science is different in different cultures. So in the West especially scientists, but most students I have in the West, they just think science is right. They just think science is right, and they don't really have an understanding that science has historical and cultural story, just like any other human endeavor. In other words, who's doing the science? For example, in the last generation, as women came into science, it's changed a lot. It's changed, the sociology has changed, the questions we ask has changed. Uh, who, which money is available to do science, all these things change from culture to culture. So what is going to read now is a beautiful example of this. And this is very basic, the most fundamental part of modern science is evolution. So when Darwin first presented his ideas, very nervously, by the way, to the world, in 1863 or whatever it was, he, his ideas of survival of the fittest and natural selection went into, he was, in, he was in England, and England had the British Empire, including where we are sitting now, and when his ideas went out there, they were received, and even though Darwin talked about evolution of aggression, how important aggression was and being stronger and survival of the fittest. He also talked about compassion and emotions and evolution of those things, but that's not what the society picked up on. The society at that moment was at a British Empire and the Industrial Revolution, and they said, ah, here's the scientist telling us that bigger is stronger, empire is strong, white people can do what they want, they're big, they're strong, and a whole political movement called social Darwinism arose from Darwin's ideas. Now, keep that in your mind for a second as we listen to Kunchuk read about what he was seeing in his mind when he took evolution class at Emory. So when I took the evolution class at Emory, so I had learned a lot. And when I first learned the emotional states such as aggressions, anger, desire and fear are necessary from the evolutionary perspective F for the survival of species. I found it, it challenging to accept. In Buddhism, these emotions are considered epileptic and disadvantages. And therefore, we need to remove them. So we need to renounce, you know, in Buddhism we say, saying all those things are like the five poison or whatever, we have to renounce that. But based on scientific thinking, this, these traits evolve and are adv advantages to organism. For example, for have, if you are more aggressive, you will be more likely to survive in the population and probably, probably get greater access to resources. But then I saw a resolution to this challenge. Evolution does not class classify traits such as this emotion as good or bad. Human culture do this, actually each of these emotions can be good or bad, negative or positive, depending on the situation. The negative should always be rejected and the positive adopted. So, so I found that you know, in the, when I learned the evolution theory or evolution uh, biology. So, so I, I've seen that, so this, these are like sort of a cultural tension in science, in Western science. So, so my question is, 
in in the West also there there are many tradition, many religions, and many culture. And so, is there any? Of course, religion, but you no, know, any culture and any traditions that transcend with the Western science. Yeah, so just to emphasize what Kunchuk was saying, I thought it was so striking that he had the exact opposite response that the British had to Darwin's ideas. He was like, how could these things have evolved? The Buddha said, we're not even supposed to have them at all, right? And then he had the great insight that evolution's not saying what's good and what's bad. Evolution is saying this is what happens, and humans decide what's good and what's bad. But uh, certainly, especially evolution, to answer your question, Kunja, especially teaching evolution in the south, southern United States, or really anywhere in the United States, where people, uh, quote, don't believe in evolution, right? They, they think that God created the world, and they think that creation is independent of evolution. It's either one or the other. Creates similar kind of tensions that I was talking about uh, that some of my students have, you know. They certainly, some of them will accept evolution when they need to, right, in the biology class, but then have very different ideas when they're uh, with their families or in the church. And I, I don't really make an effort to judge them one way or the other. I just encourage them to not pretend that those things are not, you know, just not to separate them in their minds, but to look and identify where the tensions are and to try and work them out, think through them, and not just pretend that they don't, that there's no tensions there. So I, I'm not there to tell them what's right and what's wrong, I'm there to teach them again, to translate the ideas of science into their world, but, and to encourage them to think about uh, any, any points of tension, to identify those points of tension, and then to think about them, not to pretend they don't exist. So those are just some ideas that we wanted to talk about, uh, but we now open the floor for any questions you have about uh, any of the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, actually, t tonight and tomorrow we head back down south to the monasteries to continue this project. Um, and so we're looking forward to getting back to, to work teaching, but we'll, in the meantime, we'll take any, we'll take any questions. Oops. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone, including Professor and Kishela and Kishel. And my question is that very simple. And when each time I know more, and my mind become a burst because that my simple question is that, that does the tree have a life? Like they have a life, but they have soul or not? And my second question is that these days more and more scientists are coming towards the religion, and especially Buddhist. Why these are changing? Thank you for your question. And so this, the first simple question is for me, yes? Thank you for a simple question. <laughs> so, I mean, this, 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 uh, this question is like, it's very common. No? So according to the, the Western science, or especially the biologists, no? the, so trees and all the plants, they have you know, to purchase the life. And they believe, it, you know, also you said this. So to purchase life, have to some property, property like reproduce, and you can uh, uh, do, do some some traits. It's you no, know, we need it. But Buddhist perspective, like you no, know, so we don't say that you no, know, the trees or uh, plants have the life. So we have the different definitions. So according to the de that definition, so we said that. So so I don't need to tell the definition, but you no, know, it's it's very quite simple. And so, that, you know, according to that definition, so we believe and we said that, so trees doesn't have life for just life. So se second question is also for me? No. For you. The hardest one is for you. <laughs> uh, well, I remember when we first started about talking about plants having, being alive and everything, that everybody started laughing, all the monks. And nuns started laughing. We, we were like, "What's? Why is this funny?" And, and they, then they explained to us that, uh, you know, this this idea. But it kind of gets at the question we talked about earlier about sentience. So, is there a difference between being alive and being sentient, or being 
response, having a response like to sunlight, moving to sunlight, or plants can even, if, if one plant gets injured, it can send out a signal to the plant next door that it's been injured, so get ready, protect yourself. You know, so it, it does this, plants do these complicated things, almost behaviors, so does that mean they're sentient? You know, again, it's a question, the sentience question isn't one that Western scientists would typically look at. I think a Western scientist would say, plants have stimulus and response. They don't have a nervous system like we do, but they have a very kind of way of communicating. In fact, some people argue because plants can't move, that they have a more advanced, they have to be more evolutionary advanced to deal with danger. So do they have a soul? I don't know. Do they, are they sentient? I don't know. But they, as a biologist, we can say we've shown they do all those things. So then it's up to you, I guess, as a Buddhist, to decide whether they're sentient or not. For the second question, it's related to that, right? So His Holiness said yesterday, and he said many times before, that Buddhism, we kind of cheat with Buddhism because Buddhism is more open to experience and experiment than, say, Judeo-Christian traditions, creation, creator religions, where it is said, and this is the way it is, right? Because at least... Tibetan Buddhism, or at least His Holiness says, if you can demonstrate to me that I'm wrong, then I'll change my idea. That's not a typical Judeo-Christian approach, at least in the classical sense. So we, it is kind of, I think that's why you might see more scientists, or why it's easier to teach monks and nuns some science maybe than maybe some other traditions. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but um, I think, yeah, you want to add something? I mean, uh, so I think it's also better to like try to analyze like you know, sentence being and sentence things. So to analyze those things, those two, and first you have to know the, what sentence, sentence means and to, so if you know the, the what is sentence, then you analyze sentence being and sentence things. So we can say like, so plants are sentence things, but not sentence being. So if we say the sentence being, so, so, like, you can think like, like us or some other animals. I, I want to um, just return a bit to your comments about translation, because the experience of translating English to Tibetan uh, is that it's translation doesn't occur of course uh, one word at one time it's the requirement is to hear the idea and then the translator translates an idea uh, yesterday when we were uh, we had our, our our meeting with his holiness he had made a comment about how the Tibetan language uh, has a capacity to consider certain kinds of ideas uniquely. And I recognize that when you speak more than one language, that it's as if you are two people, because you are not simply translating in, in a classical way. You really find places where one of you, say you're to the Tibetan you, cannot speak to the English speaking you you are different. Uh, there is no way to translate. And so I'm wondering, uh, because y uh, those of us that are only speak English, I wonder from the Tibetan uh, language perspective, what questions are we not asking? What, what, what do you think we're missing because of the limitations of English? And what does Tibetan have to offer the Western scientist, what what are we missing? It's a simple question. <laughs> so normally, what I think um, is like when you are like the Westerner or the, the English is your first language, so you never try. They most of them like never try to learn the other second language, and so for example, the, the, the Tibetan and uh, people, and then the others like uh, who are uh, who 
speak I or Tibetan or Hindi or whatever. So they're always trying to learn the second and uh, second the English language. So what I think is like you know, also the Western scientists and Westerner, it's it's also better to learn Tibetan, and then um, not only you can get uh, the oral transmission or whatever like you know the teaching, and you can learn you by yourself what uh, what it says in the Buddhist text or Buddhist philosophy. And you can understand more, and uh, you can you can get more idea. And so, as uh, the Dundu, you know, in the, the book said, and and also I said, so when we started learning science, it's also very really helpful to uh, learn the Buddhist understanding. And so, I hope if you learn the Tibetan, it might helpful to understand you know, the, the the Western science more profound, and also the Tibetan. I should say that um, Geshe Lakdor and Sandu, Samfel, and many others, there's a, a, a big parallel project to this project, a uh, translation project, uh, where every year there's a meeting of all the great tra uh, Tibetan language scholars from around the world who get together and they talk about the science terms that are coming up in this project and they translate, they decide on new Tibetan words to use to translate the science terms. So we're almost to the point where that's gonna be available online on an app, where there'll be a new Tibetan language, if you will, that's kind of grown out of the science project. So that's an important piece of the translation, but uh, I appreciate what you're saying. We can, when we're teaching, we can tell the difference in the monks' responses depending on who the translator is. So clearly there's something <laughs> that different translators translate differently. Um, so it's an important and complicated question, translation. Testily, Professor uh, I have one very important question. <clears throat> I really want to know what is energy? And the universe is created by energy, as scientists say. And uh, <clears throat> in Tibetan Buddhism, especially in the Tantra, uh, tantric teachings uh, also because I'm learning Tibetan yoga and then you see everything is created by what we call lung or chi or prana and uh, I usually translate as energy and uh, <clears throat> even the word Tibetan lung it has many meanings for example lung it's the air you know or sometimes we say lung lang sha, which means somebody get angry. So also we use the word lung. And then lung also has uh, basically, you know, uh, three different kinds of uh, subtleties. Lung uh, rakpa, tawa, shunto tawa, you know, uh, grows subtle and uh, uh, what do you call it? The most subtle one. So that's why it's quite difficult to understand, you know, what lung or energy is. So. Also, from the scientist's uh, point of view, you say universe is created by energy. What do you mean by energy? The five elements, are they energy? Or, you know, are there more subtle energies that you talk about, you know? So when you talk about the, the body, you know, uh, the, the, the genes, you know, are they, are they created by energy? And what kind of energy, what do you mean by energy from, the, from your Understanding. Thank you. Uh, good question. Complicated question. Not the best person to answer it, uh, but I'll give it a shot. I know that uh, from talking to His Holiness and from talking to many physicists, that this is a place where many physicists and Buddhism come together around these ideas, although they're not using the exact same terms, it seems that the same ideas are there about energy, uh, everything being made of energy, nothing actually being there, but it's just uh, a collection of energy at that point that makes this book here, but it's really energy, everything's energy. Um, so I think there's a lot of, so I'll just say a couple of things. One is I think there's a lot of conceptual overlap. So if you read David Bohm, B-O-H-M, his conversations with His Holiness, that's what they talk about. Um, it's a little bit beyond me, but I think they are understanding each other very well. And there's books you can read where they have a conversation 
about this very thing. When we say energy in biology, or maybe Joel can talk about energy in medicine, we're thinking very specifically about uh, ATP, about molecules, heat, things we can measure very easily in biology. Um, and I th think they're probably a result of the energy that you're talking about, but not exactly the same thing. So uh, that's the best I can do. But the best, re again, the best I've seen is these conversations with David Bohm, who's a theoretical physicist, and His Holiness, and they talk about, uh, I think, in a very striking way about these ideas. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer. Did you want to say anything about that? It's okay. It's okay. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question is to a professor. Uh, since you have been, been a teacher and you taught to uh, university students in the USA, and after that you be, have been teaching to uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks, so what was the biggest challenge that you faced teaching towards the Tibetan Buddhist monks? And uh, what kind of questions arise from two different the students, from Buddhist uh, the students as well as the not the the, the non-Buddhist students, the lay the people that you teach, and did, uh, does that the those Tibetan Buddhist monks they learn uh, Tibetan debate system? So did that really helps you in teaching, or did that really makes you teach tough? Well, the the debating is great, and we try and bring the debate teaching technique back to the United States because it's such a great way to think about what you've been talking about and to take the other side, if you will, and challenge each other and go back and forth. So that's a great teaching tool that we, we use in the classroom here in India, but also in the United States. I mean, I, I think the challenging situations are uh, where, where the, so for example, talking about reincarnation something so initially so different from a biological explanation that you can't even start the conversation. Um, or we were talking to the monks once about evolution and how people initially thought uh, in ancient times that things just spontaneously appeared and they said, oh yeah, that happens in Tibet all the time. If you put leather in a drawer over the winter, then in the spring, a frog comes, the leather turns into a frog. Um, but a lot of these th things, so, and similar things happen, there are these moments where there's disconnect, right, in every classroom, in, anywhere in the world, right? So the trick, I think, is not to laugh and not to dismiss that, because clearly there's some root there, right, that you want to explore more. So often those kind of things are a way into learning a, what we call a teachable moment, right? Where you can learn more because the student has revealed something about him or herself. So for example, with the um, leather turning into frogs thing, we say, well, that's an interesting thing. We hadn't heard about that. Um, let's see if we can design an experiment to test that. Let's approach it from a, we're scientists, this is a science class, let's approach it from a a s experimental perspective. So we designed, so the monks designed an experiment. They took some leather and they put it into a big plastic Coke bottle and they put some holes in it in case the leather turned to a frog and the frog wouldn't die. And they put the bottle uh, in a drawer a couple of years ago. And so far, no frogs. <laughs> but interestingly, the day after we had that conversation, I was walking back from the guest house at Drepong into the monastery and the monsoons had just started and all of a sudden all these frogs just appeared <laughs> out of the ground and I saw aha this you know this is what happened right you could see exactly what happened somebody had some some leather sitting on the ground or some dirt and they threw it against the wall and then a frog was there Right, because that's what happened. It looked like the frogs that just appeared. Because what these frogs can do, of course, is just live underground and stop their metabolism until water comes for months or maybe years. And then they, it, it looks like they just 
appear. And then finally, as far as the reincarnation thing, uh, Kunshuk and I were sitting, having our, one of our conversations in Atlanta, and he was taking a class in epigenetics. And what epigenetics is, is uh, how our genes respond to our environment. And recently we've discovered in the West that some of our experiences that we have, the sensitivity or the, uh, po yeah, the capacities and the sensitivities of those exper experiences, we can pass those on to our next generation. Right? So Mendel, the monk, told us that we could pass genetic material, we could pass genes on to the next generation. What we didn't know until recently is that you can also pass on sensitivity to some experiences you have on top of those genes. That's called epigenetics. Well, when Kunchuk and I were talking about this, we realized it sounds kind of like reincarnation. Because what reincarnation is, is you're passing on your karma, your, your karma, your experiences are passed on. Now, of course, that's not just to the next generation. That can go to any other sentient being. But that concept of something that you experienced being passed on is now showing up in Western science. So surprisingly, even, this is what I mean by thinking, don't, don't dismiss and laugh because you never know what new ideas will come out. But thank you all very much. Thank you very much for this very enlightening talk on the enlightened gene. And uh, through this question, it becomes very clear that how much more wisdom exploration we need in any sphere that is there in the world. It's always important not to accept anything by its face value, but explore, analyze, especially in the case of subtle realities, call it mind, call it energy. For me, one of the probably easiest way to find out what is sentient, what is not sentient is go from human beings, go sm smaller, 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 you go up to mosquito. They're also very active, we call them sentient beings. And there are many like bacteria, as you mentioned, which are very, very subtle and they're also doing their job very efficiently. So from that you can also almost conclude that if such tiny, you know, beings can exist and uh, function, why not smaller then? So that's why in Buddhism we have a realm which is called formless realm, which is almost like pure energy, but very much functioning. So there's a very interesting area to explore. And this problem of demarcation between what is sand and what is not sand and has been discussed extensively during one of the Mind Lab conference. As, as far as I remember, they agreed that sentient being is something that can move from one place to another place in search of food or something like that. I don't, don't remember exactly, something like that. So anyway, it's very interesting uh, thing to explore things. But one last thing that I really would like to mention regarding, it's a story regarding the need of wisdom. So there was in India, there was a great teacher who was giving uh, long teaching to his students. Then after the teaching, he said, he told one of his students, take this book and place it in my room on the table. And then the student goes with this book and then comes back frightened, saying that there is a snake near your table. Then the teacher said, okay, no, no problem, I'll give you some mantra to recite. And then go there and keep the book on the table. So by reciting this mantra, he goes there, <laughs> still comes big, <laughs> frightened, saying that I recited your mantra, it didn't work. Then the teacher says, take this lamp and put the book on the table. He goes there and then he realizes there's no snake, it's just coil of rope, you see? So with this, this is a wonderful story to show that we can really see the reality properly with the light of wisdom, not through mantra <laughs> or any other things. So thank you very much for sharing this uh, light of wisdom. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you with this small gifts. Uh, just as a reminder, we're giving these two books to Geshe La to keep in the library here if you're interested in reading it, or it's available in any uh, website that sells books. Okay.